Alright, I'll pass on to Richard. I'll just briefly introduce you, um, but maybe you just want to talk a little about yourself. And then yes, we'll do. Just have you the, 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 the presentation out. And once we just finish, anyone that wants to we'll talk about, you know, studying at Sussex, that kind of thing, then I will chat to you, we'll have questions, and I'll be able to answer anything you have. Okay? Well, thanks very much for coming. Um, oops. We really appreciate you coming out this afternoon. It's hot out there, it's late in the afternoon, you could be doing other things. So we do appreciate you, you coming by. Um, I'm Richard Follett. I'm Professor of American History at the United... Uh, 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 professor of American History at the University of Sussex. And I also am Director of International Recruitment uh, for the University. So I have a wonderful job. I get to spend my time writing on American history, publishing on American history, and I'm also working in different international environments, meeting fabulous people such as yourselves and, and others in schools and universities and the like. I'm a historian of race relations, and the scholarship that I write is principally on the history of slavery and emancipation in the U.S. So I write about enduring problems, fundamental problems to American society, uh, on those questions of race, the legacies of slavery. And I think it's always an important thing to start, actually, whenever you talk about American history, you talk about African-American history, let's say, people of African descent in the United States. It's always incredibly valuable to start with a long sense of history for African-Americans. Because the first, first African-Americans were brought to the New World to the British North American colonies in 1619. And from 1619 until 1865, it's a period of 250, 300 years of slavery. All right? Mm -hmm. Freedom comes in 1865 and is short-lived in the American context. Because by 1877, so just 12 years, after the end of the American Civil War, we do talk about that in a minute's time, by the end of this, by, by 12 years later, African Americans have been disenfranchised. The institution of racial segregation, and you're familiar with that in the, the, in the Deep South, disenfranchisement, segregation, black coloured here, white there, that type of thing, had been completely sealed, so that by 1890, African Americans had lost their vote entirely in the southern U.S. states. And that situation endures until 1965, when African Americans, of course, secure the vote through the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. The legislation of the 1960s really solved the problems that were unresolved in the 1860s. So when students and, and people said to me, Richard, because I work on slavery and these things, they say, Richard, why is it so important in the American past? Because I turn to them and say, well, the reality is, is that the history of African Americans, you can only talk about freedom for the last 40 years. That's what the history of black America has been, a short duration of freedom, a much longer history of slavery, racism, disenfranchisement, all those things. So, it's an area which is hugely important to me. And of course, it's one of those massive topics in the American past. One of those huge topics. Well, how then do we assess the presidency of Barack Obama, the 44th president of the United States? The 44th president... And I think it's fair to say that 2016 has been a political realignment across the world. Wherever we look, whether we look in Europe, whether we look in India, whether we look to Fidel Castro's passing in Cuba, we're beginning to see a political realignment emerge. The rise, the re-emergence of the nation-state, the resurgence of nationalism, the resurgence of ethnic nationalism, moreover. If you think about Brexit, Trump, it's all about America first, Britain first, Erdogan in Turkey, it's the same, it's ethnic nationalism. Uh, Narendra Modi in India, 
profoundly linked to a history of ethnic nationalism. And it's on that ground, that's where he's ended up with so many political tensions. And in fact, we've seen it just not just in the election of Donald Trump, but the very clear positions taken in the last three days about the future of the United States as he envisions it. Not only will he roll back much of the Obama policies, but he's made it abundantly clear it's going to be America first, disassociating from international trade negotiations. He's going to place U.S. jobs front and center, U.S. security front and center, not national alliances, NATO, CETO, these types of pan-world alliances, but instead the U.S. is centered at the first. So I think one thing we could say about Donald Trump and Barack Obama is that he's really a really we're at a historical turning point between a multi, if you like, multipolar world in which Barack Obama was trying to link multiple countries into a broader set of alliances into a much more national-centric, ethnocentric definition. And in Donald Trump's case, that's also been very clearly a white-centered vision of what he's he envisions the United States clearly to be. You couldn't have seen a more clear statement of that than the inauguration ceremony. Go back eight years ago, the dais is packed with African Americans. Friday, it was uniformly white, wasn't it? Staggeringly so. White and male as well. <laughs> and that's really, a, a, you know, one of the, the, the statements about Trump that we, we clearly all highly familiar with now, is who voted for him. A white, not just poor, that's not correct, it's not a white poor vote. It was a white middle class vote, and it was a white middle class women's vote, as much as it was a, a men's vote. Which puts in context what's occurred over the weekend again, with the rise of women's protests worldwide on the election of Donald Trump. He enters the White House as one of the most controversial political figures we've seen in the last half century. But what then? Why should Americans, who've never really ever voted for an extremist political figure, there's never been in American political history a Donald Trump equivalent. There have been people to the right, to the left, but only really within that kind of centre-left, centre-right. And yet Trump's captured something here, just as Theresa, just as the Brexit people in Britain captured a moment of unease, an alienation, all of those things. So given that, how do we assess, how do we assess Barack Obama? And we won't go through the full talk because it's just inappropriate with a, a, a small group of, uh, as we are today. How then do we assess him? Because when Barack Obama was elected in 2008, throughout America, there was great optimism, and you know this, you know, optimism that Obama would open up a post-racial period, that somehow the divisions of race that had long divided America would be resolved. He campaigned on the promise of hope, change. And in many respects, he's delivered on that, right? He's ushered in criminal justice reforms, which protected hundreds of thousands of immigrants. He advocated for gay rights, protecting those, really protecting them on a federal level, uh, and in widening that compass of democracy. He's appointed racially diverse leaders to different posts. He's embraced the widest, most gender neutral of cabinets that one has had over the last 50 years, really historically in any presidency. Maybe his supporters say Barack deserves more credit than he deserves, gets for resolving some of the problems of the Great Depression. And of course, Obamacare. The expansion of health care. But, eight years on, Obama faces a deeply divided nation. 
Trump could not have happened without the divisions of American society. Most Americans conclude that the country is bitterly, divisively divided, and Trump's election has exposed those divisions more, more, more visibly, I think, than any other election that we have seen in recent historical past. Far, far fewer people than ever elected Barack Obama see his presidency ultimately as yielding the changes for black Americans in yielding up a post-racial America. And that, of course, has been encapsulated by the, the wave upon wave of, uh, of police brutalities, criminality, uh, uh, police brutalities, acts of real, real intimidation that have dogged and humiliated so many, many people of, of, uh, of, uh, of colour in the United States, and of course the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. It's an irony of supreme ironies that the first African American president should also be the president who's had to, in, who's had to, uh, who's endured at the same time the emergence of a powerful new strand of an African American civil rights movement. So within the black community and without them, therefore, Barack Obama's presidency has been haltingly challenged. It's challenged by economics. The depression has been challenged by major racial disruptions within the United States, caused, I must add, caused, of course, by white brutality and white police brutality and an assumption about criminality, an assumption that dates back uh, many, many, many centuries. Obama's then, Obama's sense of where he is as a politician is where I'd like to sort of come to, to, together. Because Obama, perhaps more than any previous president, certainly all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century with Woodrow Wilson, Obama's been a student of history. He really has watched and studied the past. Even when he was running for the presidency, before he was even running for the presidency, in 2004, Obama wrote that he wanted to be a transformational president in the way that, say, Abraham Lincoln had been during the Civil War, or that Franklin Roosevelt had been during World War II. That he placed himself against that level of transformational expectations. It's phenomenal. Think about putting yourself up against the, really, the greatest of American presidents in their roles that they, that they ultimately conducted. He's been a student, therefore, of history, but he's also been persistently keen to place himself in a long line of American civil rights activists. And in many respects, Barack Obama has constantly used certain key expressions. He's used this expression very frequently in his, in his speeches, and it's drawn from Martin Luther King. And as we shall see, King becomes a fundamental pillar of who Barack Obama is as a politician, and thus what his legacy would be. And the quote is, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Barack Obama's vision of the universe, of history, of himself, of the future, was of a long arc over time, a bending arc that starts in the 19th century and continues onwards. And upon that arc, that bend, if you like, of justice, of moral justice, of social justice, of racial justice, he's positioned himself as one of those figures, if you like, a star along this arc that has, has stretched across time. Obama's used another expression a lot. The right side of history, the wrong side of history. Well, think to yourself, what does that mean? Who's ever on the right side of history? Well, right side is what we define as right side, of course, isn't it? Right? And as he's made clear, the right side of history is his side, but it's also this history of a social justice, racial justice, integrative justice for all. 
The wrong side of history is Donald Trump. It's the Republican it's the Republican right. It's the Tea Party. All right? It's the Brexiteers in Britain. It's those individuals, political movements, that seek to limit the arc of justice. Once you begin to get that message in a Barack Obama, a lot of the other parts of his presidency start to fall into place. And in many respects, one of his problems as a president, and I think this is true of so many presidents, right? Everywhere, is how do they get the message right? How do they tell their national audience and an international audience their particular focus? For Barack Obama, this idea of this long line of justice with himself as an actor, as a powerful actor for social and racial change, positions him in this huge pantheon, if you like, of life. And so, for Barack Obama, the right side of history all right, has placed him alongside three people. And he mentions them all the time. You go through his presidential speeches, his congressional speeches, his, um, his public addresses, State of the Unions, etc., etc., inaugural addresses, he constantly refers to these three men. Abraham Lincoln, the president during the American Civil War, from 1861 to 1865, who of course ultimately emancipated four million African American slaves. He was assassinated in 1965. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the leading civil rights reformer of the late 1950s and early 1960s. The probably the most definitive civil rights leader of the 20th century, assassinated in 1968. And Mahatma Gandhi, the anti-colonialist, the originator of the idea of non-violent direct action, who led a campaign of resistance against British rule in India, of course, also assassinated in 1948. Those three men are constant figures in Barack Obama's presidency. So, when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, all right, Barack stood forward and said, said these words, I stand here as living, as, as a direct consequence of Dr. King's life work. I am living testimony, he said, to the moral force of non-violence. Linking himself to King or to Mahatma Gandhi, who of course produced the key thing about King, is to understand, as I'm sure many of you perhaps do, that the ideas that King applied in the United States from 1955 to 1965 were ideas that he had borrowed initially from the writings of Mahatma Gandhi. Indeed, it was King who went to India in 1954 before he ever launched any part of the civil rights movement. And as he said, I come on a pilgrimage. So important were Gandhi's writings to Martin Luther King. His ideas of moral, of non-violent direct action, which you saw in the American civil rights movement, of African American protesters standing in the streets silently, with, uh, not reacting to electric cattle prods, not reacting to the water hoses that were sprayed at them, that idea of non-violent direction action, Satyagraha was what Gandhi called it in Hindi, life force, literally translated, was central to how Gandhi had fought the British, likewise not trying to go face to face, toe to toe, gun to gun, but instead breaking British rule by forcing, as Gandhi argued, 
by forcing the world to observe British violence against Indian passive resistance and to force, as Gandhi hoped, forced British soldiers who were beating the Indians to realise this moral crime inside them. That was Gandhi's theories. King had taken them on board. It was fundamental. He adapted those strategies in ways that Gandhi had never used. But to both Gan to, to King, Gandhi was his touchstone. But so too to Barack Obama were both men as central, central plants of, of, of who he thought he was a president. When he went to India in 2010, um, he, he announced, I'm mindful I might not be standing before you if it hadn't been for Gandhi and the messages he shared with the world. So for, for, so for Barack Obama, throughout his presidency, even against political opposition, and we know he's faced incredible political opposition in Congress throughout those eight years, trying to push through some of the liberal agendas that he has embraced, an agenda to widen the compass of American democracy, including communities that had not been part of the American democratic vision as fully as he envisioned. That's why the issues over gay rights were important to Barack Obama. That's why the expansion of a more broader racial franchise was central to him. He wanted to create, in effect, a new vision a vision of social justice, a justice that would claim, it would equate and link back to these figures in the past who'd made huge steps, steps that he believed were transformational in his own life. Well, that sense of being on the right side of history really committed, uh, committed Barack Obama to a sense of national integration out of many one. If any of you have got a dollar bill or one I'm knocking around at home or even some coins, you'll see it on the back, e pluribus unum. That sense of America is out of many one. Of course, that out of many was always a glaring contradiction because America was not out of many one. Slavery itself was such an enormous scar and contradiction and hypocrisy to that idea of out of many one, that it remained the cutting edge. And many historians will talk about, about slavery being effectively America's heart of darkness. It's the one thing that punctures American identity and freedom. Well, how can you have freedom when you've had a history, as we pointed out at the beginning of the talk, that is loaded with unfreedom? It's denial of freedom is as American as freedom itself. I talk about this to my students and I say, look, for Breton, the original sin is colonialism. That's what, that's what grates deep in Britain, in liberal Britain. It can't quite tackle that once that country was a colonial power across vast chunks of the world and the consequences of that are enormous. And it, it is a grinding issue that never really goes away as, a, as an issue. Nor should it. Nor should it go away as an issue. In the American context, slavery is that touchstone. It's that contradiction. Out of many one, therefore, was very much Barack Obama's attempt to eliminate, to almost to come together across this horrific divide in America's past. And I think it's important to say that for Barack Obama, therefore, unsurprisingly, who should he look to as the kind of key figures that who are his kind of intellectual forefathers? None other than Abraham Lincoln. A white president, for sure, but of course probably in many respects the originator of a civil rights agenda for black Americans by liberating slaves. In, in 1865 themselves, the slaves uh, were fundamental in, in, part, in, in that process themselves. More of that I can talk about another day. But for Barack Obama, as he called it, and he stated this on his inauguration, Lincoln made my story possible. 
when he took his first inauguration, he took Lincoln's Bible in his hand and sweared the oath. All right? Eight, four years later, in the second one, he put two Bibles, one on top of the other. It was Lincoln's and it was King's Bible. Just as he tried to bind himself up to this kind of heritage. Now, I'd suggest, all right, that Barack Obama's commitment to this integrative vision actually dates back to his origins, to here, to Kenya. Now, of course, you know that Obama's been faced by this virulent sea of attack over the birth of movement in the United States, launched many years ago, actually, by uh, Senator Hillary Clinton in her attempts to unseat Barack Obama uh, herself. That was transferred into the Trump regime, and this this argument somehow Barack Obama was born here, and therefore by dint of that was non was not an American, and therefore could not be a president at all. The constant slur about the Obama, the Hussein Obama connection, this Arabic connection, was constantly played strong amongst the, the Republican right to play him as somehow the descendant of an IS level radicalism. His commitment to Obamacare. Label was labelled as socialism. None of these things were accurate, of course, vastly unfair. But for, for Obama, I think, and this is an important point, which comes back to the Kenya story, and I was really thinking about this last week as I was putting together this talk for today and a few times earlier in the week. If you go back to, to, to his, his initial book, um, Dreams for My Father, and when he talks about going to Kenya, of course, he was born in Hawaii to a white mother, as she is, and to uh, uh, Barack uh, Hussein Obama Sr., who, who saw uh, his son at uh, childhood and then once again when they were 11 years old. So very, very limited uh, contact with, with his estranged uh, father. But he maintained a connection to Kenya, of course, and returned. And he returned as a sort of 22-year-old back, back to Kenya. And he talked very passionately in the dreams of my father about going to Kenya, what coming to Kenya meant to him. And he called it that Kenya filled an emptiness. It was, he said, for the first time, he felt the comfort, the firmness of identity. Now, he himself spoke about ethnic and tribal distinctions and violence within Kenyan society. But for Barack Obama, that integrative sense that he made the story um, of himself in Kenya um, became an important part of his story. And I'd suggest to you, in closing in today, and really in closing what we're chatting, we can open it up, for questions and debate and whatnot, all right, is that for Barack Obama, that sense of creating that integrative identity, that idea of being one, all right, was a personal journey. And it was something rooted in his own fractured identity as a young man, all right, but also a sense that he found himself here in Kenya. And I think actually, in soon, in very soon, you'll see Barack Obama come to Kenya much more frequently. I think he's always played. One of the questions I faced earlier in the week was, so what, can, what has he achieved for Kenyans? All right? Well, remarkably little, of course. All right? But one of the questions that we might have as, as something to think about, really, is he's always had to navigate between being a Kenyan, or having the Kenyan connections, and being the President of the United States. A commitment also to being an a African American president, as in Americans with descendants in Africa, black Americans, and also a sense of being a truly African hyphen American, a descendant of, of Kenya America, if you like, rather than the slave America of West Africa and the Caribbean and all of that kind of story. But for Barack Obama, then, Kenya filled an emptiness. And I think in many respects that set him off in his own political vision. That if he, if, 
he himself had found an emptiness within. The nation too, his role upon this moral arc, was also to find integration out of separation. For him, that meant tackling major minority issues. On a foreign policy level, it meant also a multinationalism that brought him into dialogue with other nations through trade agreements or other initiatives. But it also meant linking himself emotionally to this legacy, to Lincoln, the great emancipator, to Martin Luther King, who announced, there he is on the famous speech, you might have heard it, the I Have a Dream speech, a dream of a post-racial America that King spoke in passionate terms in 1963, on the footsteps of the Lincoln Memorial, and there's Barack Obama in front of the Lincoln Memorial, when in 63, King spoke passionately, in perhaps the greatest, one of the greatest uh, speeches in the modern era, about a post-racial vision, about black and white together. He called it America's unfinished business, unfinished because the great emancipator, of course, had not fully emancipated the enslaved people, leaving them into a political and social quagmire of racial segregation, which, as we've discussed, emerges in the late part of the 19th century. So for King, sorry, so for Obama, his legacies were of Lincoln's unfinished work, and those were words that Lincoln used just before he died, that he had unfinished work ahead. For him, it was King's unfinished business. It was Mahatma Gandhi's profound, significant goals of nonviolent direct action. So, for Barack Obama, and in some ways, cynics have put it more, more bluntly than I, which is to say, despite this immense promise, incredible promise that the man's elected on. The first African-American president, breaking a colour line for 240 years, all of that. He's faced an impossible level of political opposition from Republicans in Congress. And actually, in some respects, all that Barack Obama had is history to run for. But as we come to the end of his presidency and we move into a new one, I think it's important for us to say and we know the contradictions. Obama's presidency saw an unprecedented level of increase in drone warfare, the victims of whom never felt the moral arc of justice. Obama's administration pursued anti-terrorist actions against IS, including the assassination of Osama bin Laden, in ways which were greater than those of his predecessor, Republican George W. Bush. All of that is absolutely true. But it's also accurate to say that as Obama looks to himself, and I'd be so interested to see, he's only 55, so he's got 20 odd years of politics really ahead of him. Or more, who knows? Right? What this man will do in the, in the next 20 years is a very interesting question. It's always very difficult to retire as a politician from the most powerful job in the world when you're really actually quite young. So that remains to be seen. But I think to understand Barack Obama's place and the tragedy, therefore, in certain respects, of the contradictions that we've seen in the Obama presidency's passing and Trump's election and his vision for America, is that, as Obama's seen it, this massive arc has positioned him as a star, a star that links back through Gandhi, through King, I'm sorry, through King, then Gandhi, back to Abraham Lincoln. A civil rights crusader. His vision for America was so, rad, was so encompassingly vast, actually, that in many respects, that was the central problem. How could a man achieve 
this integrative role, bringing all these identities together, bringing the unity together in one presidency. A presidency that, of course, we'll talk about this, does not meet with popular support, but unfortunately meets with wave upon wave of political resistance. So thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Barack Obama president. Yeah, so um, at this point, um, the lecture is over, um, and this is all open to you guys to make it um, as interesting as interactive. Um, nothing is off the table. Um, any questions you've got, um, well, let's, let's have it. And if someone else has a question, and somebody else actually has a different opinion on it, actually that's what makes this This is essentially what the seminar class is in the UK. Um, that's what we're trying to reenact here. Uh, for those of you who are kind of thinking of going to study either in Sussex or somewhere else, this is what seminar. I was fortunate to also study in the UK, and seminars are probably the best part of my study experience. I didn't much like presentations because then um, it's going to be very awkward. But look at me now having to do presentations. They do pay off because they make you do it over and over and yeah, over true, again. Yes. And then um, you watch yourself. Nobody likes to see themselves presenting. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when you're forced to watch it, there are two things that happen. You can improve, or you start to like yourself. <laughs> very weird. You, get very, you start to so we know. narcissistic. <laughs> um, so those were the two things. Uh, but seminars I really enjoyed. Uh, so Richard obviously asking the questions. Who will answer? Um, we had such a good time at Turi with the kids there, St. Andrews. And I think... Um, they were a lot younger, they were 15, 16, 17, and we were blown away. Fantastic. We were blown away by the critical depth and the analytical nature of their questions. Sure. But let's make this more than that, so that it's more about everyone also chipping into the discussions. So if you can do that, it would be great. I mean, if you want to talk Barack Obama or the Trump president, it's great. If you also want to direct, if there are any people here, and I know it's kind of build as both, which is if you have any interest in studying in the UK and whatnot, um, or the University of South Seas. We're happy to talk about those things as well, but, yeah. but, but we'll open it to you. It, it, you know, we're not here to talk about the university. It's more like a kind of experience mm -hmm. of what UK education is sort of like. And I do American history, so that's what you've got. Unfortunately, <laughs> my colleagues could have come to you to talk about either coastal erosion or, or other things, but we kind of thought that Barack Obama's passing out of office mm -hmm. and the rise of Donald Trump might be more, kind of more mm -hmm. relevant for today. Yeah. Can I just check? Did, when you saw the topic, I think people saw it on, on the internet. About this, yeah, about this um, lecture. Today. How many people saw it on the internet? Okay. How many people got it from a friend or something? And how many people got it from Uniserve? Okay. So can, can I, I just ask again? you, just around, what got you interested in the topic? Again, you don't have to speak, but if you do, it would be nice. Anybody goes first. I'm always interested in knowing about Abraham Lincoln, so too bad uh, I'm late, but I'm glad I'm here. Yeah, we're going to have the recording of this, so it yeah. should be great. You can still listen to it. <coughs> Excellent. Anyone else? No? Okay. okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I liked it. I mean... Um, Maybe they didn't. That's what they want to say. Yeah. Maybe you didn't like it. Maybe that's the you didn't like it. Maybe you didn't like it. Um, but even if you didn't like it, um, I hope you've taken something away from the topic. Um, the looking at the legacy of Barack Obama in a possibly different way that maybe you probably did. I um, mean, we tend to more more often than not interpret things from a point of reference that we already have. And um, we have this type of confirmation bias for a reason, where we just load up anything else to suit what we already have. So um, in many ways, I'm very guilty of that. And I've been very fortunate to work with Richard. One of the things he has to put up with, besides traveling with me, <laughs> is debating with me in his office. Till sometimes after work, we're still in his office debating till like 7, 8, 7 p.m. Late, when everyone else is gone. And I've been, I think I've been forced, I don't say this to him because it's going to get really swollen edit. No! Um, <laughs> but I'll say it to him because I think it's helped me grow in the way I think. Um, I've been professors like that. I mean, he's a very well-published, well-known international figure. 
and it helps shape how you see things, how you kind of take outside, step outside of your own kind of how you assume assumptions. Such a big problem, assumptions. You just assume and you think that's the way it is. I generally, when Obama came in, I remember his, his first when he was elected, I tweet, I put something on my Facebook. I was always a very political person. I didn't vote for it. The only time I ever voted in the UK was Brexit. That's the only time. And I can vote. Commonwealth nationals can vote in the UK. I just, and we lost. And we lost. And I voted and I lost. So, um, <laughs> but... So if there's any jobs available. <laughs> <laughs> but it tells you that I wasn't that involved. I follow politics a lot. But, you know, if you don't vote, you can't complain. They say that for a reason, and I voted. So, um, when Obama first won his, his first election, when he won, I remember getting on Facebook, and I was feeling that euphoria with everybody else. And I, was I, I just typed something, talking, barracking myself home. That was what I just typed to my friends. Apparently, like four years later, when he won again, one of my friends who was a news journalist, was just going around picking up news feeds, all over the place that people had shared. And he didn't even send it to me once. I saw it shared with someone else with my name on it, Barakin myself. So to that DBC, Barakin home after Obama's election. <laughs> and it just got me thinking. Because deep down on one hand, I was having this feeling of sentiment. He was a black man, you know, mm. thinking the world is going to change. It's going to be all lovely and the honey will start flowing everywhere and manna will fall from above. <laughs> and... Do you know what? On a deeper, on a deeper critical level, I'm thinking maybe because he's black, it's going to make it more difficult for him to actually do anything. Yeah. You know, but I was like, no, he's going to do it. Um, he's going to come to Nigeria. So actually, I was thinking of, like all that Nigerians. Why would he? I mean, really, why would you open yourself to those kind of things when you need to be very careful because you're black and the first black African president? You've got to be so careful on how you, where your loyalties could easily be misassumed. And so when I started to talk to Richard, you know, he got me seeing things from such a different point of view. And so when, we, when he was coming to Kenya with me, he said he would put his time out to do this. Normally academics come to the UK a lot. I'm sorry, to Kenya, to African countries, to India. They go, they travel a lot, and they do their research, because that's, that's what they are. But, you know, they're experts as well in this field, and just like... I'm happy to do this, and I'll talk about what I research on. And if people come, great. If people don't come, well, we just kind of like we just have to argue with each other as usual. <laughs> and, um, but you guys came. Um, we're happy, and I hope you guys will be able to tap and ask some questions. And if um, I will take you from there. Can I ask you guys a question, though? Because you, you, you follow. You probably wouldn't be here unless you were interested in the states, interested in Obama, or interested in in, in in politics, for that matter, actually. If you think about the way in which presidential figures are presented in media, all right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's long-form media, that's to say in long articles, in newspapers, you know, serious debate papers, um, or whether you end up with a short form, and, and we know that news media is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. That's the, that's the sort of social media revolution that we've enduring and down to a tweet. Well, you know, you've got that in the White House right now. <laughs> All right? But as we do that, actually one of the things that I think is true of, of journalism, and this is no criticism of the journalistic craft, which I have a huge amount of time for, but we don't tend to see how presidents or political figures envision themselves. We just look at their actions rather than try to understand in a certain respect how that action fits into a much larger sense. So we talked about the, you know, having a, a discussion in the car yesterday about the Obama um, doctrine in foreign <laughs> affairs. But actually what I'm suggesting to you today is actually there isn't an Obama doctrine for foreign affairs. There's an Obama doctrine about himself, about how he fits in. And it, you see it that way, that all these different things that he does begin to fit in to a bigger picture of how a presidency works. And that's something I think that as a historian, which I am, um, that that's what we bring to the table, the ability to bring that larger story and say, okay, so he's pulling on 
Why is, why is he made reference to, to King and Gandhi and Lincoln and these likes? A lot of people were very cynical over, over the presidency, saying they're sound bites. They're sound bites, and they're using these incredibly powerful figures as a way to kind of shape his presidency and frame who he is. But I think once you put this personal story in, you know, which roots back to that Kenyan origins, not origins, but you understand his Kenyan family and that sense of finding an identity for himself. And that's been a perpetual story through, through the, the, the three, essentially, autobiographies of, of his life, is finding that story. And once you think of it that way, you start to think, well, is that what he was trying to do as a president? And no president can speak quite like that. And I think this is what's here, is slightly different from what we would get ordinarily. Because Barack Obama's never s stood up and said, I'm doing this, this, and this, and this, because I want to link myself to the legacies of all these great civil rights activists. Right? To do so, can you imagine the political response if he did so? He'd be hammered for the hubris uh, uh, of that sense that, you know, here he is, and he's kind of linked himself to Martin Luther King Jr., you know, one of the great martyrs of the 20th century, or to Abraham Lincoln, who's really the father of the nation. Well, that's a tough ass to follow, is to say, you know, that. So I think it's one of the difficulties in any president, and the way that politics is reported, is how do we understand the bigger picture, the bigger frame in which these people are acting. That's our job as political commentators, and certainly as historians. And I think it's one of those things that will shape Obama's presidency, and what makes the big break with Trump? Well, we were talking about this as well, which is, it would be really wrong to think of Donald Trump as exceptional. He's not that exceptional in America's political history. They don't come very often, but neither do these kinds of social activist, moral compass Civil rights activists like the Obama King ladies, they don't come that often either as major figures. But if we took the conversation around the other way and said, how symbolic, how representative is Donald Trump? Well, I could tell you examples ranging all the way back through the American past of populist leaders like him being able to play the outsider angle the disenchanted, the disgruntled, the anti-establishment, the anti-corporate, anti-Washington anti, um, line, they have just come time and time and time again. Donald Trump is not, is not really an exceptional figure. And that makes him a bit more scary. And my God, there's enough to be scary about, isn't there? <laughs> but if you take it actually in this long historical context, this is a kind of soft story, because yeah, ultimately we all want to think of ourselves as being on the right side of history, to use, but, but to use Obama's term, right? But actually, there's another side of history, and that's a story that has a huge long history that leads to Donald Trump. So he's not, he's not really the outsider. He's just another version of America's political tradition. Just a new variant on some old themes. Which I think suggests a deeply alarming element about persistency in American politics that means the difficulties of change. And anyway, that's my, that's my ten cents for a while on that. Anyway, over to you, if, if anything at all. I've got a question, and it's not just to you, Richard. I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to hear your views on this. Because actually, I don't think I've asked you this question before, but I want to hear what you guys think about it. Because the question is pretty, it's around the lines of, as we know, there's a lot going on in Europe, in, in the US now, this nationalism, as we've said, ethnic nationalism, the right wing, you know, more driven by pretty much, in a way, sentiment and raw emotion of being um, not a part of the process, um, or being more. Um, Maybe the co corporates being in control, yeah. and the, the people don't have any power anymore. And that's one of the things Trump says very much: is um, you know, um, make America great again and giving people 
power again. So, but it's happening everywhere. But on the other hand, on the flip side, Africa is, seems to be coming together. For the first time, we're having an African Union passport. And there seems to be more railway lines trying to connect people together. And it seems to be things that what's happened back then, we're now embracing ourselves more. Why it seems people are becoming more isolationist. Do you think, this is for everybody, do you think Africa is, that's actually a right interpretation of what's happening in Africa? Or do you think there's a chance that that trend is actually going to happen in Africa as well? The ethnic nationalism kind of trend. Yeah, if you just introduce yourself very quickly. Yes, 24 hours before he came here, I talked to one of my teachers and I told him that I have to come here. I found he's not my teacher, but one of my students, mm -hmm. a tutor. Then uh, he told me, would you, would you like to have even a minute to tell those people about us? And I said, yes. And uh, we are teaching in very remote areas, special uh, the people living at the margin, refugees. Yeah. And um, we are trying to see how we can give them a chance to have access to higher education. Brilliant. And these students are very brilliant, but they don't have a chance yeah. to have a space like this one you have. And when I had that message from my student, and I said I have to talk to people like you, it made me remember that I have met with people again like you, but today they are now ministers. Mm. And I have to tell you this, not him. Even him, including you. <laughs> yeah. So um, whenever we will be in a place like this, uh, it's better to think about what is happening around us and yeah. what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. We are having so many refugees, and this problem is talking about populism and war. I think it's more of African problem more than it's just not European, European or um, North, American, American, yeah. North American problems. And let me take my focus on the Great Lakes and it touches even Kenya. Yeah. Because if you go outside, someone will ask you where are you from and you will want to know which ethnic group you belong to. Which is not really easy in the United States no, as a mission student at Rikis University. And it's not really easy, but if we try to look at what is trying to happen here, things will be worse in Africa than they are in, a, in the United States. Yeah. Then, um, yeah. going to uh, what my student told me to tell you, is this, whenever you will be moving, think about the refugees living in the camp, they don't have much more time to move. And I came late because I'm coming far away, to Kano East, and I could not reach this place <laughs> at a good time because I had to, to uh, take a long distance flight. Then, my point is this, now going to uh, uh, answer, uh, here. Uh, I don't think that we have to compare uh, the African and the uh, Western, Western style of things. You see, in ours we have two things different. We are having the heritage we got from colony, yeah. and we are having our past that we don't really have to reconcile. It's kind of fighting in between us. Because if we go to history, I like much more meeting with a, a, a progress of history, uh, not much more building that in the field. But when we go to history, we had our own ways of living. And thanks to God what happened, European and Western came to us and brought a new style of living. Then, coming with new style, so the people we have, me and you right now, we are people that don't have a clear identity, mm -hmm. you see? And we are in <coughs> And it's a chance, but again it's a loss. A chance, why? Because we can easily adapt to anything happening. A loss, why? Because we don't have any roots, so easily we can be weak. Mm -hmm. but, but so, uh, now, going to... Uh, the plant and why I came here. I saw it on net and I felt, oh my god, I have to go ahead and try to listen to what is really happening because even the internet on the other side is a big problem. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> when coming on my road, I met, I could not reach here unless I used my phone to try to check the place. Mm -hmm. But now, this is the plant I want to tell you, the future leaders. What I see in you, I see the people that will decide on the future you're going to have. We will be having time to lead our countries and leading our institutions. I don't talk much more of politics because leadership is not only politics. Please make sure you don't use the physical appearance for a person to judge or to give him whatever you have to. And the service will be provided to provide to everyone. This is the way that we will use to bring much more peace. Going to Barack Obama, I will not have much more time to tell you about that. Barack Obama came in, I agree with your plan, he came in when people thought that he'll do magic and he could not do that. Because of what he said again, his color of skin. So we're still having a big problem when people are still having a problem of understanding that the person should not be judged because of the way he looked like, but because of what he can produce. 
And that's what we need to seek. And thank you so much for bringing this. And I have a kind of little uh, 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 request to UNICEF. UNICEF, so please, do you please get more time to think about people living at the margin? Um, I'm a small teacher, I'm a tutor at Geneva University, and having only a few 20 to 10 students that I do uh, give a course on human rights, but also in art, as uh, I can give applied art uh, to uh, little kids, see? Then, if you would think about those people, see about what they face. When I say what they face, they cannot move. They have brain, they have intellect, they can use it. And one day their countries need them to go back. And this you turn against to you, you are Africans, right? These people, if they don't return to their home countries, what will happen? That's the question. And when they return back and they cannot get something to give back to the country, then they'll be easily manip manipulable. And what will happen? Politicians will use them, because they need power. And once they need power, they'll use them to fight. And once they fight, don't say you don't care because it's not your country, mm -hmm. but what I know is that you might be a bound, you might be an idols. They are bound to an idols on the other side. When they are suffering, they'll come to you and help to help, help them. So that will touch you as a person, whatever you are and whoever you are. Mm -hmm. That will have to touch you. So it's our responsibility to try to move on and to think about those people. Professor, Thank you so much. does your university think about the people living at the margins, refugees? Yes, we do. And in fact, just to give an example. Now let me give a thank. No. Thank you so much for <laughs> this kind of things. I'll be happy to come next time, but please put it on. Uh, make sure you tell people. Well, we before. can make it this available yes. so that you and your students can can discuss yes. this in your class. But you asked about, you know, does our university the address uh, <laughs> address people on the margin? Yes. And um, I think, you know. Two examples, and just make two, and, uh, and honest, honest examples to your con uh, question. I have a, this, this job which involves me in travelling quite a lot in different parts of the world. But I was in Bangladesh about a month ago, and our university, Sussex, have partnered with a new university called Asian University for Women, and just women, young women, uh, at all. and they had been uh, a university that was going around in um, refugee camps, the Rohingya refugees on the border of Myanmar and Bangladesh. And they were working with Rohingya refugees and bringing them into Asian University for Women. Those women had never had the opportunity of formal education. So in point of fact, it was a school system that went all the way up, really, which finally culminated in the university. So they were there for six, seven, eight years, some of them, receiving a kind of education. They're also working in, 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 in areas where, where migrant workers were being used for textile manufacturers, as you know, very much cheap clothing coming from areas of Bangladesh, you know, a lot of the, the brands that we familiar by, those are made by child labour. And, and the Asian University for Women was, was reaching out to this. And so we as a university went directly into that, all right? working with people on the margins, here in the most visible of margins possible. Our own university, um, and I think it's something I should be proud of, actually, we work, we're one of the universities with the largest number of, of, of first degree, first university students in their families. So, for them, they were the first kids to go to university. We've got one of the highest percentages in the United Kingdom.